Good evening, everyone. I'll start again. I'm Alan Watson, and as many of you will know, as well as being a member of the Council and the Management Board, I chair the Scottish Board of the Institute and Faculty of Actuaries, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to the 2019 IFOE Spring Lecture. It's a pleasure to see so many people joining us here today, um, and I'm going to particularly welcome those of you who have travelled far and wide to come to Edinburgh itself tonight. Um, it's a typical spring afternoon in Edinburgh, I thought, today. Um, tonight's lecture is a slight departure from our usual thought leadership event. Um, it's the first time that the Scottish Board has joined uh, with the IFOA's public affairs and research team to present a joint lecture. Uh, I'm pleased that this lecture will showcase the work of the Scottish Board and the partnerships that exist within the IFOA. Um, let me extend a welcome to those of you here in the Royal College of Physicians here in Edinburgh. Um, I'm glad we were able to tear you away from watching the latest news on Brexit, which no doubt the developments in Westminster we will be kept up to date with. Um, <laughs> he's got something with him, right, yes. Um, I'd also like to welcome online viewers from across the world. Um, we have over 650 people uh, that are live streaming us this evening. I promised some of them I would wave at them. Um, and we also have um, some people that are actually joining us in larger groups. There is a group of people in Staple Inn in London uh, that are being hosted by Cartina Thompson. Good evening, Staple Inn. Um, there are some people from the old library in the Lloyds of London building that uh, Richard Galbraith is hosting. So good evening, Lloyds of London. Um, and a special thank you to those at Lloyds who have helped facilitate that. Um, in Glasgow, Ben Farmer has got rather a lot of people, I am told, he's packed a few rooms for the Glasgow Student Society. And they've got uh, lots of people watching there. Um, the Institute and Faculty of Actuaries is committed to showing how actuarial science can adapt in a modern and ever-changing world, and our profession is evolving, as many of you will be aware. Um, we are ready to engage and collaborate with other professions to shape and make sense of the future world. And we do this by facilitating and promoting the work of our members and volunteers through our research and policy work. But we also hold events for our members and the wider public to give, give a voice to our profession. And that includes the two flagship lectures we, that we deliver each year, one in the spring and one in the autumn. And our lectures are delivered by experts from outside the actual profession who are leaders in their fields. They provide insights on subjects of relevance, not only to actuaries, but also to those outside of our profession in business, politics and public service. As a chartered body, uh, we have a duty to speak up where we have the ability to inform debate, to offer an expert opinion, and to offer tangible solutions to real world problems. And this lecture has been one of the best attended we've ever hosted here. And that reassures me that as a profession, I think we're on the right track to make sure that our voices are heard. Now, our speaker tonight. Um, tonight, we will be tackling a topic that has dominated the news for months. Months? Years, it feels like. Brexit. And I don't think we could have picked a better date. Um, in, 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 in correspondence with me, um, Sir John was very happy with early ma March, as long as there wasn't an election the following day. Now, we managed to pass that risk, um, but perhaps we assumed that two weeks before EU exit day, we'd know a little more about the hows, the whens, and even if we would be leaving the EU. Um, but as we sit here tonight, MPs are currently in the process of voting on a no deal Brexit after rejecting last night's um, proposals that the Prime Minister came with. Um, so that deal didn't last. Um, it's now, it's not very often that we get politics as volatile and unpredictable as this. Um, the final nature of Brexit will undoubtedly affect the industries in which we work as actuaries and the way in which we live our day to day lives. And so whether the outcome will be for better or worse, we cannot yet say. But Brexit has generated such polarised viewpoints, it's surely no surprise that politicians still can't seem to decide how it should be implemented. At the referendum, a majority of voters said the UK must leave the EU, but more than two years down the line, are we any further forward with honouring that result? Have people's opinions changed? Will we be asked to vote again? And do any of these outcomes truly reflect the result of the 2016 referendum? Now, I can't answer these questions for you tonight, I will leave that to our guest speaker. If there is anyone who can help us understand how Brexit came to be, we think it is Professor Sir John Curtis. 
He gave us our best shot at understanding what has been going on for, he gives us his, uh, our best shot at understanding what's been going on for the last two years and is best placed to provide insight into a subject that is dear to our hearts as actuaries, what might happen in the future. Sir John is well known for his expert research and policy method and polling methods in electoral behaviour. It is for this reason that the Scottish Board asked him to come and share his experience. He is a professor of politics at Strathclyde University in Glasgow and senior research fellow at NatSed's Social Research and the ESRC's The UK in a Changing Europe Initiative. He's written extensively about voting behaviour in elections and referendums in the UK, as well as on British politics and social attitudes more generally. He is a fellow of the British Academy, the Royal Society of Edinburgh, and the Academy of the Social Sciences. He is also an honorary fellow of the Royal Statistical Society. However, as, as Britain's preeminent sophologist, he is more familiarly known as the man who won the 2017 election. So I'm glad someone won it. Um, he is a regular face in the media, giving impartial insight into the facts and figures behind the driving trends of the UK electoral politics. And with that in mind, I'm delighted to introduce our speaker for this evening, Professor Sir John Curtis, who will be evaluating the question, Brexit, democratic success or failure? Sir John, over to you. Um, first of all, can I express my sincere thanks to the Institute and Faculty for organizing this. I'm perfectly well aware that they've put quite a lot of substantial resource and effort into organizing this, um, and I'm delighted to be given this chance to give this lecture. Mind you, I guess some of you are probably asking yourself, how is it possibly going to take him 40 minutes to answer the question that he set himself? Isn't it painfully obvious? You only need to stand outside College Green for five minutes uh, to, to be aware of what you think the answer might be. Well, actually, if you stand outside of Bre uh, College Green, one of the things you will discover straight away is that there is quite a division in public opinion because standing outside College Green and constantly making a noise behind the media are A, a group of ardent Brexiteers, and B, a group of ardent Remainers, and they stand out there even yesterday evening when the weather in London was almost as inclement as it usually is in the west of Scotland, um, they were still out there um, uh, 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 promoting their cause. I guess also we should have perhaps realised that maybe, you know, this is the 13th of March and, that, you know, maybe we, should have, we shouldn't have anticipated that necessarily we'd be all, uh, we would be all three clear by, this, by today. Um, but anyway, um, I'm delighted to uh, try and have a go at this. And in a sense, what I want to do is I want for us to stand back a little bit from the immediate headlines and the immediate parliamentary manoeuvres. I think one has to say, um, uh, you know, never has the BBC Parliament channel been more exciting than, frankly, since about mid-November, because every time the Prime Minister gets up, um, she really has given rather a hard time. And, you know, it now actually matters which way MPs decide to vote, because they're voting for themselves. Makes for great sport, even not necessarily for great government. Anyway, um, to address this, essentially what I want to do is, I want to kind of, uh, uh, by saying, you know, is Brexit a Democrat success or failure? I want to address the fact that we're talking here about how a re referendum result is being treated. And there are a couple of criteria that I think we can use in trying to judge whether or not a referendum is a success or a failure democratically. One is to say, um, and this is, that, you know, how, that, that this is an instrument that is intended to bring public policy into line with public preferences. At the end of the day, general elections are a way for voters to send a signal, but general elections are about many issues, and they're not just about the issue uh, positions of the parties, they're also about what you think about the merits or otherwise of the politicians who are promoting those priorities. So it's a multifactorial judgment. With a referendum, at least, you can put an issue before the public and ascertain what the public think about that. So therefore, you know, we can therefore ask ourselves, well, is it referendum, and is the Brexit referendum, has it been successful in bringing public policy into line with public preferences? Now, out of that potential criterion, 
There is a fairly obvious question that is commonly asked about referendums. And that's, well, actually, do the voters have clear public preferences or policy preferences in the first place that actually could inform public policy? And there is a long-standing literature in my profession about whether or not voters are or are not sufficiently knowledgeable in referendums and if they are under what circumstances are they and are they able to use shortcuts in order to be able to come to a judgment that would be as good a judgment as if they, as if they were indeed perfectly informed. That's a rich literature, but it's not the literature I want to get into this evening. I want to get at something that I think clearly is an important criterion so far as the June 2016 referendum is concerned, is whether or not the preferences that the public expressed in a referendum have actually been implemented. And once you ask that question, so this is not about was the, re you know, what were people voting sensibly? It's about what do we do about the result? Okay, that's the question I want to focus on. And that raises two questions. The first is, is are we clear from the outcome of the referendum what people's preferences were? That's point one. And the second question it raises is that when we hold a referendum and we say, look, you know, if the public vote this way, that's what we'll do, it assumes that the state has the ability to deliver. But of course, one of the crucial attributes of the EU referendum, the Brexit referendum, is that delivering what the public are thought to have expressed as their view in June 2016 did not simply lie within the purview of the UK government to deliver. Rather, this was something where they would at least have to go through a process laid down by the Lisbon Treaty, the Article 50 with which we are now all very, very much familiar, um, and that that laid down a process and a timetable by, and actually a procedure by which we could extricate ourselves from the European Union and perhaps then subsequently form a uh, relationship. Um, so, and, you know, there were echoes of this issue, arguably in the Scottish independence referendum, which those of us in Edinburgh and Glasgow will be familiar with. The Scottish Government proposed a plan as to what independence would look like, and probably we might want to say what well, at least there was a plan, and whereas there wasn't a plan for the Leave vote. But it, what, and one thing, however, that very clearly emerged in the Scottish independence referendum is that delivering what was in the uh, Scottish Government's plan wasn't solely within its purview to deliver because, for example, it said we wanted to carry on using the pound, but the UK Government says, no, you won't be allowed to. And there were other issues of that kind as well. So when we hold a referendum, we say, you know, we, we the people who are proposing this referendum, we will implement your wishes, it assumes that whatever state body is making that promise has it within its ability to deliver. Now, we've had referendums where that has been possible. When we had the referendum on introducing the alternative vote for the House of Commons, that referendum that I'm sure all of you remember and were absolutely riveted by back in May 2011, it was within the ability of the state to deliver. Indeed, the legislation was written, it had been passed, it just needed the public to say yes, and the public said yes, the rules would have been changed. Um, there's a clear example of where this issue doesn't arise, but with the Brexit referendum, certainly it does. So with those observations and with the focus then on effectively how effectively Brexit has been implemented, um, I want to ask three questions. The first, which flows out of the first issue I raised, is well, what did voters want? What were they expressing? in the ballot box. The second then, okay, if indeed the point of this process is to satisfy public opinion, what do the public think of the outcome? So far, of course, 
we do tend to forget in the immediate heat at the moment, that even if Theresa May were to get her deal through tomorrow, that simply starts round two of the negotiations, during which most of the issues that we've been talking about will actually be settled. We've settled very, very little about the Brexit process so far. But, anyway. And then thirdly, obviously, is, well, that's what the public said in June 2016, but is that still what they'd want to say now? And in the light, perhaps particularly, of what they think of the outcome so far and what Brexit therefore might actually mean, are they still in favour or not? So that's what I want to focus on. So yes, as you've guessed it, I've orientated us towards looking at public opinion. Now, actually, so what do voters want? Well, the truth is that um, what voters wanted was what was not on the menu, at least so far as the theology of the European Union was concerned. So here's point one. Um, this is some, uh, okay, I'm going to show you data from all sorts of sources. Some of it's going to come from some research I've done, uh, and, and this is uh, an example of that. So I've been tracking people doing the Brexit referendum, uh, Brexit process, um, trying to ask questions that don't include words like single market, customs union, freedom of movement, all that stuff, but trying to turn it all to plain English. And this is simply a question most of the people look at it. Do you think we should allow European Union co uh, companies to be able to trade in the United Kingdom freely in return for British companies being able to do inside the European Union? So it's trying to turn free trade into plain English. Uh, the blue line up there is the proportion of people who said, yeah, that's something I would like to see to emerge after the Brexit process. And the orange line are those who said they wouldn't. As you can see, there is no argument about maintaining free trade with the European Union. And it therefore follows that, above all, there was no argument amongst Leave voters about wanting to maintain free trade with the European Union. Um, both Remainers and Leavers are almost entirely at one on this issue. They were immediately after the referendum and they have continued to be during the Brexit process. But of course, because the European Union says the four freedoms go together, and that therefore if you want to have free trade, amongst other things, you have to have freedom of movement of labour, we also know that one of the issues that was important in the referendum and probably was central to the result was the concern about immigration. So, to get at this, um, uh, and this is one of a number of questions I've used, but this is an example. So this is a question in which we, I basically said that, you know, out of the Brexit agreement, you know, do you think that European, so people from the European Union who wish to come to Britain to live and work should have to apply to do so in exactly the same way as people uh, from outside the European Union, which is now going to be the principle that the British government will use if we do manage to extricate ourselves from the European Union. The blue line is the proportion of people who supported that proposition, the orange line those who are against. Now this is a bit more controversial. There are some Remain voters out there who will go, no, actually, I don't agree with this. I don't want to see this because that principle is basically code for ending freedom of movement. But as you can see, particularly at the time of the referendum, although, and it's, this is by no means un, uh, a unique source of evidence on this, support for wanting to do something about curbing immigration has declined, although it's still the view of a majority. But as you can see, the public, A, no problem with free trade. Freedom of movement, yes, there is a problem. So although economists would want to argue that the four freedoms should go together, you want to have capital, labour, uh, 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 all, all moving together, the public don't see it the same way. So if you want to know what the public wanted out of Brexit, they wanted what was not on offer. And I'm going to argue that in part the reason why we are where we are is because of that 
uh, fundamental contradiction between essentially the structure of public opinion and the structure of the elite debate. Public opinion isn't required to follow the rules that are laid down by uh, organisations, and in this case, they certainly didn't. Now, of course, once you say to people, well, hang on, which matters to you more? Is it remaining inside uh, the single market, or is it ending freedom of movement? And this is an example of the many kind of questions that's been asked, this comes from opinion. The blue line are those people who say, well, the more important negotiating priority is staying in the single market. The green line are those who say, that it is ending free movement. Now, notice the red line, by the way, are those people who go, I can't answer that question. Now, that in part will be people, you know, not knowing what their view is, but probably is also an indication of people indicating, you know what, that's not a choice I want to make. I want both. All right? But you will then notice that once we start to ask people to choose in the way that Michel Barnier and the European Union think they should choose, public opinion in the UK begins to split pretty much 50-50 between the two options, although the concern about immigration is a bit lower than it once was. Um, here's another piece of evidence from uh, another company which has asked a somewhat different question. It says, agree or disagree, that greater control of immigration is more important than having access to free trade. The green line are those people who disagree, so those are the free traders. Uh, the blue line are those who uh, prioritise immigration. And certainly, again, back in the early years of the process, we were pretty evenly divided. More recently, uh, the concern about immigration has become somewhat less important. But you can see how the public um, begin to divide 50-50. I personally have had my go at this. I've had a go at this Noel Edmonds style. This is my deal or no deal question. It assumed, I assumed that virtually everybody in the UK was in favour of maintaining free access to the single market. The question is, what price are they worth to pay given the European Union's rules? And it essentially says, look, you know, um, uh, if the only way we can get British firms still able to trade freely inside the European Union is to allow people from the European Union free, the right to come here, should we do that deal or not? And if you ask that, well, again, if you go back to the early years, here, September 2016, pretty evenly split between those who say, yeah, we should do the deal, and those who say we should not. Now, it's balanced around thereafter, and again, as you might expect from what I've shown you already, the concern about staying inside the single market now seems to be more prevalent. But again, we, you know, whereas I could get you complete unanimity virtually on the principle of free trade, once we start saying, well, there's a trade-off here, it becomes more difficult. And above all, of course, what you discover is that although both Remainers and Leavers would, a majority of them, ideally, want to end freedom of movement, but maintain free trade, force them to choose, and they begin to polarise. So here you know, is the last three uh, polls done by opinion that I showed you earlier. Um, and as you can see, forced to choose, two-thirds of Remain voters go single market. Only 14% say ending freedom of movement. And on the other side of the fence, three-fifths of Leavers prioritise ending freedom of movement, only one in ten prioritise the single market. So, the, the polarizer, once you start to force the public to choose, the potential for polarisation of public opinion in the UK was clearly evident. And here again, a similar picture from my own research. Um, the Remainers willing to do the deal, the Leavers, for the most part, reluctant to do so. So, the potential for polarisation of public attitudes was always there. But of course, what's been true, and it's true both of the government and of the Labour Party, both our principal political parties have been trying to seek a compromise. Theresa May, yes, has had her red lines, her red lines of getting out of the European Court of Justice, ending freedom of movement, and the right for the UK to make its own trade deals. 
But once you accept those red lines thereafter, she was then after as frictionless a trading relationship as possible. So while on the one hand she was articulating what she took to be the principal concerns of leavers, but then trying to take on board the economic concerns of Remainers. Now the Labour Party is in favour of a softer Brexit, but the rhetoric of the party is that we want to bring together the 52% who voted to leave and the 48% who voted to remain. So yes, the Labour Party says we should leave the European Union, but then of course wants to remain inside a customs union and wants to have a close alignment with the single market. Oh, but by the way, we still don't want freedom of movement. Oh, and of course, Germany doesn't like those state aid curb rule, those rules on that curb state aid. So, the first clear revelation of what Theresa May's compromise meant was the Chequers Agreement of July of last year. And here is the data on what the public thought of the Chequers Compromise. Yep, the short answer is, well, one is, what are we talking about here? A lot of people, even by September, half of people going, I don't know whether this is good or not in this data from YouGov. But amongst those who do, only 10% said, that sounds all right. And 40% said, no, it does not. Secondly, here was a development in the Brexit process that succeeded in uniting the country. <laughs> Both Remainers and Leavers were more or less of the same view by around four to one that if they had a view that it didn't sound too good. And indeed, if we just look at the picture a little bit after Chequers, by which point we start to get polling about those Heinz 57 and varieties of possible Brexits that we might have. So here's an example. This comes from BMG. It was done in September. And it's arranged from, on the left-hand side, the most Brexity option, and on the right-hand side, the most remaining option, but reading from left to right, no deal. Canada, which basically means lo loose free trade ar ar arrangement whereby we basically accept each other's rules, but you have minimal, minimum uh, uh, extent of regulatory alignment and minimal uh, rules in terms of permitting freedom of movement. Checkers. Norway, so Officially, Norway being inside the customs union, but not, uh, sorry, being inside the single market, not being inside the customs union, but basically code for soft Brexit and remain. Blue column is the distribution of the public of the whole, and the orange is the remainers, the grey line are the leavers. Two points to note. First, public opinion is fragmented. None of these options commands majority support of the public as a whole. But two, and crucially, public opinion at this point, or by this point, is polarised. The, the, the most popular option amongst leavers is leaving without a deal. The most popular option amongst remainers is to remain inside the, United, in, in, inside the European Union, unsurprisingly. So by the reaction to the Chequers Agreement and the structure of public opinion by this stage was already one whereby you could see how coming up with a compromise was, that was going to satisfy public opinion was not necessarily going to be easy. Let's just take a little um, uh, a, a parenthetical walk at the moment, however, about, well, by this stage, what were the public expecting? The short answer is not a lot. Um, here's an example from um, ORB, 
asking people, do you agree or disagree that the Prime Minister will get the right deal for Britain in the Brexit negotiations? So this is looking at you know, how expectations are developing as the Brexit process emerges. You will notice there's a period here when more people agree than disagree. It's bounded by two events. Event number one, one the first event, is the Lancaster House speech of January 2017, in which the Prime Minister first laid out her understanding of what Brexit should mean. In the wake of that, the public went, oh, sounds like she's got some idea of what she's on about. And public confidence in the government's handling of Brexit rose. But then, of course, the Prime Minister, a few months later, went for a, wild, a rather wild walk of the woods of Wales, came back with a general election, which she failed to win, and immediately public opinion in her ability to come back with a Brexit deal that they might like was diminished. And it continues to decline thereafter. And here is Chequers. The Chequers agreement knocks the public's confidence that she's going to come back with something that they want. And yes, you've got it, it hasn't recovered ever since. YouGov, again, how people think the government was handling the process. Again, here is similarly, here's, here's how things improve in the wake of Lancaster House, uh, Lancaster House before the election. Here's the election, and it's just got worse and worse. So, public confidence in who was negotiating and expectations of what they were going to get have been diminishing ever since June 2017. But note in particular how the Chequers compromise, which I've shown you was unpopular, served to diminish further expectations and confidence. There was a warning there. What are all the public expecting in terms of these big issues in terms of immigration and the economy? Well, actually, so far as immigration is concerned, this is a question asking people every month, do you agree or disagree that Britain will have more control over immigration as a result? Uh, Post-Brexit, the blue line at the top there are those people who agree. Um, and as you can see, why continues to be around three-fifths of people who expect the UK to have more control over immigration post-Brexit. What about the economic consequences? Now, this is actually, a, 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 again from ORB, this is a question which has tended to produce a, a more uh, pro-optimistic perspective on the economic consequences than have a number of other polling series, but it's the one that's been going on longest, which is why, why I've used it. So here, for example, at this point, so this is you know, uh, late 2016, early 2017, more people on this series saying, that they thought the economy, that the economy would be better off post-Brexit than thinking we'd be worse off. But after June 2017, it becomes 50-50. And more recently, however, uh, we've begun a bit, a bit more concerned about the economic consequences. That said, levers and remainers have long since had very different views of what the consequences would be. Left-hand side here is showing you what people think about the economic consequences. This 76% here is that 76% of Remainers, by, September, by this is October, November, thought that Brexit will be bad for the economy, but 57% of Leavers think it will be good. 66% of leavers think that Brexit will be good for immigration, and this poll allowed people to define for themselves what good meant, and Remainers were none too sure. So not, well, we not only have polarisation so far as people's views about checkers, but by the time we get to the unveiling of the negotiated agreement, the public are also clearly polarised between those who think that Brexit is going to deliver on immigration um, and those who are concerned uh, on the Leave side and those on the Remain side who are concerned about the economic consequences. Okay. Um, so, let's now take ourselves to the point of Mrs May's deal. 
But by now you can see, you've already seen the warning signs. Mrs May's problems in the last three months were already baked into the structure of public opinion by the time the Brexit process uh, had reached November 2018. Uh, this is YouGov's data, support or oppose the draft deal. Now again, a lot of people go, what are you talking about? But opponents, supporters. Um, YouGov hadn't asked it for a long time, but they then asked it again yesterday. Um, no change. So, problem number one is that the public didn't like the deal. Uh, opinion, also been tracking this. These are the people who think it's going to be bad for Britain. Um, these are the people who think it's going to be good for Britain. Not very many people thought it was going to be good for Britain. Quite a lot of people thought it was going to be bad for Britain. A few, quite a lot of people you know, in the middle. And again, no sign since mid-November of increasing public support. But once again, Theresa May remarkably manages to unite Remainers and Leavers. Because as in the case of Chequers, they agreed that it wasn't a terribly good idea. The Leavers are a bit more sympathetic than the Remainers, but hardly by very much. Now, we might not be surprised that the Remainers go, this is a bad deal, but given that the Prime Minister is attempting to implement the mandate and the instruction that she feels that she was given by the vote in June 2016, it shall we say has been a wee bit of an embarrassment that you cannot point to polling evidence to suggest actually, well, the people whose instruction you are trying to implement think that this is a good idea always been a weakness in her case. Now, although, of course, Remainers and Leavers agree it's not good, they don't do so for the same reason. And this becomes clear once you start to ask people to choose between no deal, deal, and remain. And I'm breaking this down now. There are three different polls, but it's the same picture. So let's just focus on the left-hand side. So this is from YouGov. Those people with that choice, 85% of those people who voted remain said, I still want to remain. But notice the position amongst the leavers, and it's consistent across the polling data. At least a half of leave voters faced with that choice say, no deal. And at most 40% here, but in case of you guys data, only one in five, saying that they prefer Mrs. May's deal. So remember, I've already shown you how public opinion back in September was already polarised between the no dealers and the remainers. And Mrs. May's compromise has indeed found itself caught between those two positions, and neither are the remainers or the leavers being willing uh, to back it. You also remember I showed you how public opinion was fragmented back in September. It still is. This is data from opinion. This is not about the substance of Brexit. This is about the procedure. Again, I've, I've, I've arranged it. Uh, but on this case, it's the Remain side is on the left-hand side and the Leave side is on the right-hand side. But the left-hand side are those people who say we should have a referendum, deal versus remain. Then we've got a general election, renegotiate the deal, which is what Mrs May eventually did. A, deal, a referendum on a deal versus no deal, and then leave without a deal. Again, notice no option comes even close to being the view of a half of the, pu of the public as a whole. But notice too how the two most popular options are deal of a referendum on deal versus remain, or leaving without a deal. So the polarisation is still uh, there, and it becomes even clearer once you break the public down according to how they voted. The single most popular option amongst those who voted to remain is to have the referendum, and the single most popular option, again, backed by around 50%, even though they're faced with four other procedural options, 50% uh, of leavers say leave without a deal. Now, um, 
you might want to object at this point. You might want to say, well, you're asking people what their first preference is. Why about asking people, well, what would they be willing to accept? What's okay? May not be a first preference. So maybe we should be looking separately at what people think about these various options. And that's what's been done here. Not only are we doing that, um, but we're also giving people the chance to say, it's okay. The option was acceptable compromise. So people could say it would be good, it would be bad, but they could also could say it would be acceptable. Um, now, notice, leaving without a deal, once we talk about the overall public, a half the public say it's a bad idea. Holding the referendum, I'm reversing Brexit, well, uh, the single most popular response is that it's a bad idea. Um, Mrs May's deal doesn't come out too well either, only 37% of people say it's either good or an acceptable outcome. Some of you, however, depending on your predilections, may be going, ooh, look, the single market and the customs union. Common market 2.0 or something similar there too. Looks as though at least maybe around a half of the public might at least be willing to accept it and only 28% say bad news. However, I want to suggest to you that it's not sufficient for, if we're going to regard it as something that's an acceptable compromise for it to be backed by half of the public if that half of the public basically comes from only one half of the polarised divide. Because when you ask Remainers and Leavers separately about staying inside the single market and the customs union, a half of Leavers go, this is a bad idea, only around a third of them are willing to put up with it. Soft Brexit is a Remainers Brexit, it is not something that bridges the divide. And indeed, if we go down that path in the wake of the Brexit process, those who are promoting it are already warned. Here is data from Servation, who are the, exactly the same people gave them two sets of choices. They said choice number one, remain, deal, leave without a deal. You've seen this before. And you already know, therefore, that the deal, which is the middle option, is the least popular of those three. But they also asked the same respondents, remain, Norway, which had been explained a bit, and leaving without a deal. And you will notice that Norway also emerges as the least popular option. So the danger potentially for this, with the soft Brexit route is that it also, at the end of the day, will face the risk of being a friendless compromise. So the problem we have at this point is that having denied the public, the UK public, the chance to have their cake and eat it, we've created the circumstances whereby public opinion was had the potential to polarise, it has polarised and it's still polarised and the reason at the end of the day why this is so now difficult to resolve is that, you know, the House of Commons is, frankly, doing a brilliant job. It is reflecting brilliantly the fact that public opinion is fragmented and that they, we don't like Mrs May's deal, but we don't like much else otherwise. And it's also reflecting the polarisation of public opinion. But it does therefore mean that coming up with something that's going to satisfy people is, frankly, very difficult. And to that extent, at least, getting public preferences into public policy. Well, we can get our half of the country's public preferences into public policy, but to get more than that is difficult. Right, but, and finally, and briefly, but are we still of the same view as we were in June 2016? Now, I have to say straight away, um, I, I, guess, I guess I don't have to warn a bunch of actuaries that what I've done here is a bit dodgy, but I've done it in order to kind of, so you can see the point. Yep, the origin on this graph is not zero. It is 36. I've done this so you can see what's happened. This is the question you guys have been asking on a very regular basis. In hindsight, do you think Britain was right or wrong to vote to leave the European Union? Blue line is right, orange line is wrong. And as you can see, up to, and including, 
the June 2017 general election, YouGov usually found more people, slightly more people, saying the decision was right than wrong. We hadn't obviously changed our mind. Post the general election, typically YouGov have found the opposite, and indeed in the autumn of last year, tend to find the lead of wrong over, re, over right increasing, although it now seems to have stabilised, but it's now consistently getting something like an eight-point majority of wrong over right. But there are quite a few polls out there that do actually ask people, how would you vote if there were to be another referendum? This is a moving average of the last half dozen or so of polls since the beginning of last year, which is the point about which you can begin to do it. Blue line is remain. Green line is leave. Yep, the polls have been consistently showing, certainly since the spring of last year, a small lead for remain. Nothing terribly large. Though that said, for most of last year, it was bouncing round at 52.48. By early this year, it had moved to 54.46, but it's moved back down again. It's currently running at 53.47. So it's there, but it's not dramatic. But why has it occurred? Is this evidence that maybe not very many, but at the end of the day, some Leave voters have changed their minds and that therefore perhaps hanging on to the outcome of the 2016 election as still clearly the will of the majority of the electorate is perhaps a dubious enterprise. It's a bit more complicated than that. The, I, perhaps by now you should not be surprised given how polarised I have shown you public opinion is about the deal, about the procedures and about the consequences of Brexit that very few Remain voters and very few Leave voters have changed their minds. This is the average that you can find in the most six polls that have asked people both how they voted in 2016 and what they would do now. 85% of Remain voters would vote exactly the same way and 82% of Leave voters would vote exactly the same way. But notice in particular the idea that Leave voters are more likely to switch to Remain than Remain are to Leave is not the case. Leave vote looks a little bit softer, not least because some of them go, you what, you mean to say you want me to go out and tell you again that I want to leave the European Union? I told you last time, I'm not going to bother again. Anyway, leave vote looks a little bit softer, but that's it. The reason, for the most part, why the polls in aggregate show a shift towards remain, narrow though it is, even though most people haven't changed their mind, is because of the view of those who did not vote in 2016. Now, some of them couldn't, but that's by no means all of them. Notice that if you now ask them what they think, they are at least two to one, perhaps more than two to one, in favour of Remain. So it's not so much the case that the public have changed their minds, but some people out there have made up their minds rather late in the day. And this, if anything, is the group whose opinion has shifted to a degree. I can now track this going through the surveys that I've been asking. Um, I can track uh, how those who abstain said they would vote. So back in September 2016, they were a bit more pro-Remain than they were pro-Leave, but not dramatically so. By the time my most recent survey, which is last summer, I've got another one coming out very soon. Very clearly, like all the opinion polls, much more remain than leave. So this is the group that shifted, but they're the people who weren't involved two and a half years ago. Okay, so as you can see, I'm inevitably concluding that there are some important questions to be asked about the success of the Brexit process so far. But there are issues that arise, I'm suggesting to you, as a result of the way in which there's been a clash between the structure of British public opinion in June 2016 and the process through which then Brexit had to be negotiated because this was not something that it lay within the ability of the UK state alone to deliver. And we might want to expand on this later on, but although the European Union at the moment throwing their hands up in horror and saying, not our fault. Actually, the structure of the process is the European Union's fault, 
and one can argue, I think, that the structure of the process has contributed significantly to why we are where we are. So it was never going to be easy to, to satisfy most voters once free movement and free trade in combination were off the table. And against that backdrop, finding a compromise that can bridge the divide, that can keep a majority of the British public happy is proving very, very difficult. Along the way, that's helped to ensure that we've become more pessimistic about the Brexit process and what it's going to deliver. But that's not made many people change their minds. Please, please, say the leavers, give us what we voted for. We just don't think that between you, you're providing it. And Remainers go, it's a bad idea. And they haven't changed their minds. Thus the difficulty we face. Thank you, Sir John. Um, you've given us a lot of food for thought. Um, how many of you expected to hear that the House of Commons has done a brilliant job? Uh, and, and well done on the, la the last sessional meeting we had here, someone managed to get Dalek into the conversation, and you got Noel Edmonds in. So um, we're, we're certainly doing well at the more obscure references. Um, I, I found that fascinating. I thought, I thought you, you, you've, you've put put together an argument for us about why it was never going to work, I think, is, is what you're telling us. But let's have some questions from the people here. I'm sure you've all got questions. Let, let me gauge who's interested. Put your hand up if you think you'd like to ask a question. We're always a bit slow in Edinburgh compared we'll to We'll give Staple you a running commentary on what's going on, by the way. Anyone, anyone keen minutes. to ask a question this evening here in Edinburgh? They're all looking a bit quiet. Oh, we'll see if we can get an actually at the start. Is that that? Well, there's a gentleman there on the, on the, in the front row here. Just... I know, I know that, that man looks like a politician. We can be nice to the we'll, 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 we'll have the gentleman in the front then. Come on. Well, but, but someone is going to have to come clattering down with a microphone. That's right. <laughs> Very clattering down on the stairs. There is another Where microphone somewhere. Where was it? At the very front row, I'm afraid. You're going to have to risk all the steps. Thank you very much. Well recognised, Alan. Uh, I'm Lewis MacDonald, a member of the Scottish Parliament, uh, and really just doing my uh, public duty by kicking off the question and answer session rather than uh, seeking to impose my own view on the matter. But John, in, in describing the shift in public opinion, such as it is that you've been able to detect, you said that the shift is most notable among abstainers. Yeah. That then becomes a very important question. Are these people who, ab who abstain because they're not interested in ever voting on anything, or because they're not enfranchised to vote in referendums in Europe, in either of which case it makes no difference to the prospects going forward? Or is it simply people who've reached voting age in the last two and a half years or have otherwise become engaged with public uh, uh, policy in a way they weren't before, in which case what they think does matter? Um, the answer, well, the, the best answer I give you is that 57% of them are aged 35 and under. They're disproportionately the younger section of our population. Um, and although the turnout in the referendum was relatively high by the standards of the recent general elections, it still uh, was no more than 71%. And so, in part at least, um, uh, this is the fact that, you know, as, you, as you, I think everybody knows, younger people are much more likely to vote Remain than older voters, so we shouldn't be, therefore be surprised that the abstainers are, are, are much more uh, are pro Remain. But as I've suggested to you, it isn't just a question that they were always pro-Remain, but rather they seem to have moved in that direction. Um, it's also a little bit, um, though I won't bore you with the technical details, but actually the, the series that I'm tracking through is not particularly influenced by those who've come into the electorate since the age of 18. But yes, there is some of that going on, but it's not enough to 
no, driving what's going on. So, um, you know, this is a demographically, this is a group that was always likely to more pro remain, um, um, uh, but they probably have become more pro remain than they once were. But of course, what it does mean is those on the Remain side who are waving the flag for the people's vote in the confident expectation that the country would vote differently second time around are perhaps resting their hopes on a somewhat more fragile instrument than perhaps they realise. Now maybe these people will come out next time and maybe therefore as a result we, will now, we would narrowly vote in favour of Remain. But who knows? And I think almost undoubtedly it's sufficiently close and sufficiently fragile that the quality of the campaign would be crucial and that certainly means for those on the Remain side you've got to have an argument about immigration. You had no argument about immigration last time, number one, and two, you have to convince people, because this was the other crucial weakness of the Remain campaign, how being inside the European Union will actually make this country better off because although there was a lot of pessimism about the consequences of leaving, there was also a lot of pessimism about the consequences of staying. Because, of course, a fundamental difference between the position now and back in 1975, when two-thirds of the public were persuaded to vote in favour, is that back in 1975 it was easy to portray the European Union as a successful economic institution. Those days are over in the wake of the Eurozone crisis. Right. I'm going to ask Katie to take more steps to go back up to the top to find that man. But in the interim, we've had a, um, from London, Louise Pryor has asked a question. Um, uh, has there been any change in how people think the importance of Brexit compared with running the country, for want of a better phrase? Uh, do people oh, think this is getting I, I, it I, as important as it yeah, should be? I, I mean, two things to say. I mean, you know, I mean the, the polls that ask people what's the most important issue, the polls that ask people about what have you read about in the news this week, Brexit, Brexit, Brexit. And, I mean, the other thing to understand, I mean, uh, to understand is that um, on both sides of the argument, I mean, not only are we polarised, but these views for many people are very intently held. So um, one of the things that, concepts that we have, which is borrowed from social psychology that we have in political science and intellectual studies is what we call party identification. It's the idea that somebody would say, I'm Labour or I'm a nationalist or whatever, all right? So it's the idea that people identify with a political party, they have an emotional attachment such that it doesn't matter whether they put up a monkey up as a candidate or whatever, they will vote for them. They have that absolute tribal loyalty. And one of the things that my profession has been writing about for the last 30 years is the decline of party identification, that voters no longer have this emotional attachment, and this is one of the reasons why voters are less likely to go out and vote. And we've been bemoaning the fact that there's been this disengagement. Around 10% of voters for the last 30 years or so have said very strong Labour, very strong Conservative ask the same questions about Remainer or Lever, and 40% of people say they're either a very strong Remainer or a very strong Lever. So it is an issue where we feel very, very intently. And because, on both sides, and by the way, if anybody thinks that the Levers are the emotional folk and the Remainers are the rational folk, let me disabuse you straight away. Remainers are more emotionally committed to their side of the argument than are leavers to theirs. The loss that they feel that leaving the European Union means is something that's felt very intently by many people on the Remain side. So, yeah, we feel very strongly about this. We are following it. Um, and it's probably a reason why if we were to ever have another referendum on this subject, probably we would get a higher turnout. Whether we'd reach the 85% of the Scottish Independence referendum, I'm not quite sure, but maybe we would uh, certainly get back up, up to the high 70s that we used to get in general elections, because the level of engagement within the public that used to generate those kinds of turnout in general elections is now there on this issue. Uh, we have a gentleman far up in the gods up there. Sorry, we're responsible for taking the, the, the microphone away from you. But. It's all right, that, that's fine. It, it's Howard Walpole. 
And my question was asked earlier, but here's a second one. It was a fascinating analysis. Is this an analysis our politicians have, or at least have access to? Yes. Um, I give you a chance to do the advert. I run a website called whatukthinks.org slash EU, and most of this stuff is there. And indeed, I gave a presentation uh, on uh, uh, particularly the second half of what I talked about uh, this evening um, in the Palace of Westminster uh, just last week. So, yes, they do. And some of them, I'm, you know, I've spoken on to those on both sides of the, of, of, of the argument, and uh, uh, there is at least some understanding recognition, but, you know, Again, you know, the, the process that social psychologists tell you will happen if people feel very intently to both sides is going on, and that is, you know, selective perception. So we get one opinion poll on Sunday that asking a somewhat loaded question that seemed to show an increase in support for leaving without a deal, but actually the, it, well, they hadn't asked the same question as they'd asked last time, and had 44% of people in favour and more people in favour of no deal than not. That is what Nigel Farage and Ian Duncan Smith will quote every time you ask them what the public thinks about no deal. Lord, ignoring all the other evidence I've just shown you this evening. Uh, but equally, um, you know, uh, Remainers will very enthusiastically tell you as to how uh, the public, uh, every time we get an opinion poll that has 55 or 56% remain, the remainers are out there on the Twitter sphere, desperate to tell everybody about this. Um, so the information is there, but because of the environment within which we are operating, you know, the, the, those of us who are trying to provide evidence impartially, we are frankly in much the same pickle as the Prime Minister, which is that people want to believe what they want to believe, and those of us who are sitting in the middle are not sitting in a very comfortable place. So the evidence often gets ignored. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, speaking of the Twitter sphere, we've had a question from Graham Pilmour via Twitter. Are you able to quantify the impact of fake news in the referendum? No. No, <laughs> but that's a, um, a simple answer. No, um, but, but I'll expand slightly. I mean, fake news is in the eye of the beholder. Hmm. Um, and that was very, very clearly uh, evidenced by the argument about the 350 million quid. If you are a Remainer, that was a lie. Because you say, look at the net contribution, the net contribution is less than 350 million a week. If you are a Lever, it's the truth. Because for Leavers, what mattered was the fact that the fate of that 350 million quid was no longer uh, the consequence of a sovereign deficient de decision by the United Kingdom. So for them, what mattered is the fact what we pay in, because what we get back is decided by the European Union, not by the UK. So there's a, uh, so, you know, Remainers will insist that was fake news. Leavers will tell you, no. That's the truth. And the difficulty is that fake news is often in the eye of the beholder. That said, pretty clear that both sides were not always entirely accurate in their forecasts of how the Brexit process would play out. I think you've just explained what George Orwell was talking about in Double Think. Um, <laughs> Have we another question from Edinburgh? Here? Ah, now suddenly, Mr. Mr. Taylor at the front. I've, I've, I've stirred them up now. <laughs> stirred them up. <laughs> there are some microphones in the middle, Mr. Taylor, if you want to take them. Good evening. My name is Harry yep. Taylor. Uh, thanks for a fascinating and, and very insightful talk. Um, my question is quite a simple one. Um, there's quite a lot of talk about the potential for a people's vote or a further referendum. Um, is it conceivable that there could be an agreement uh, amongst the group of, um, presumably, the House of Commons who would have to agree what were the questions, what was the time scale for presenting it, and most importantly, the factual basis on which people were, were to be given the option to vote for a, a range of options? Because it seems to me that um, there's such polarisation in, in views about what the facts are, that that in itself might be something that would be very difficult to achieve. 
Yeah, absolutely. I, you know, I'm, to be honest, I'm deeply skeptical about the whole, all the ideas of truth commissions and uh, people responsible for marking campaigning homework. The way in which campaigning homework should be marked is through the critical interplay of the two sides. I.e., if one side tells a porky, the other side should be capable of pointing it out and convincing the electorate that that is the case. We have to rely, on the end of the day, a uh, 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 democratic dialogue in order to, to identify truth uh, from, uh, from falsehood. Um, we, the, 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 because, you know, at the end of the... And, you know, the 350 million was a, was a classic case, whereby, you know, once you look behind that, the point was then actually what you were exposing were different conceptions um, about what the UK's relationship should be um, with the European Union. Um, uh, I mean, more broad, I mean, let me just, just say three things about um, uh, the people's vote. Um, the first is, as I've already kind of shown you with some of the data, it's a Remainer project. And I think it has, I think the people's vote campaign has failed seriously to, to pivot. We talk about the Prime Minister not, not pivoting. Equally, the People's Vote campaign has failed to pivot. The moment that Theresa May's deal went down should have been the moment at which the People's Vote campaign said, oh, Prime Minister, it's... T I mean, those MPs, they really are rather nasty, aren't they? They won't let your deal to go through. You know what? We think you should be allowed to put your deal before the public. And they should have made a much more deliberate attempt to persuade leavers. And the Kyle Wil the so-called Kyle Wilson Amendment that we might or might not see at some point is clever because it says exactly that. We'll let your deal go through the House of Commons in exactly the same way as the alternative vote went through the House of Commons, but then we have to have a referendum to see whether it's accepted or not. Okay. Um, whether that will happen, I mean, no, the trouble is the Prime Minister's boxed herself so much on this subject in a way that isn't rational. Um, uh, who knows? So uh, that's, that, that, that's the second point to make. Um, the third point to make is that the kind of referendum we can hold now is circumscribed. Because we can only hold a referendum if we get an extension for the Article 50 process, we can only get an extension for the Article 50 process if the European Union agrees. Okay? It is not in the European EU's interest to allow a referendum where the outcome could potentially be worse from their point of view than what is currently on the table, i.e. Mrs May's deal. It is in the European Union's interest to facilitate any referendum, the outcome of which might be, from their point of view, something better than Mrs May's deal, and from their point of view, the best outcome is for us to change our minds. So therefore, deal, a, a referendum in which no deal is on the ballot paper is, in my view, now inconceivable. But putting Remain on the ballot paper, yeah, the European Union will love that. And so a referendum on, on, on Mrs May's deal versus Remain is probably the only option uh, that's available. Um, most people would accept it would take between five and six months. So we're probably now talking about September, October time uh, being able to hold it. And that's assumed that we, that we were to do it now. So it does involve a long extension. It does involve us getting involved in the European elections, etc. But at the moment, the votes are not there inside the House of Commons to hold it. Um, I think we're about to see a wonderful arcane battle between the Common Market 2.0 and the re uh, People's Vote folk for see whether either of them can come to uh, can command a majority inside the House of Commons. It doesn't look as though the votes are there for a referendum at the moment, but they might be later on in certain circumstances. But equally. Um, uh, you know, in much the way the, you know, the Monty Python, uh, Mighty Python sketch about you know the, the tribes, the different tribes and priests of Judea, um, there are many different versions of Common Market 2.0, and whether or not the various tribes and scribes of Common Market 2.0 can come to an agreement so that they might actually be able to get a majority in the House of Commons, is perhaps going to be something to watch in the next few days. Question mark. <laughs> No, Monty Python were now getting mentioned. There was a gentleman at the very front here that wants to ask a question. Uh, thank you very much, Andy Whiteman, MSP. My sister lives in Switzerland. She votes in referendums all the time. Yep. Are referendums a good idea? 
Ah. In my view, at the end of the day, uh, th there are certain questions that um, you probably do have to determine by um, having a public vote. The, the first category are indeed decisions about who should be sovereign and with whom are you willing to share sovereignty. So, insofar as any set of political arrangements means that some people whom we will loosely call lawmakers have the ability to set the rules and the regulations and the, the, by which the rest of us are expected to live and also can invoke penalties upon us uh, if we were to fail uh, to, uh, to do so, our willingness to accept the, that authority has to lie with public opinion. If at the end of the day the public do not regard those who have that authority as being legitimate, we have a problem. And that's why I would argue at the end of the day the only way you can legitimately solve the question of whether Scotland should be an independent country or should be a part of the uh, United Kingdom is through a referendum because with there you ascertain the consent of the people and I think in truth the same, it's exactly the same issue with the European Union. It's whether or not we were willing to allow Brussels to be part of our lawmaking process. And we discovered, well, I think we, we've long known that there's been serious doubt within the British public about the legitimacy of that uh, process. The second class of things that I would cover is I don't think I'm willing to allow politicians to decide the process by which they are elected. And I think holding the referendum on the alternative vote was fine. Um, and I think, you know, in general, um, that decisions about the electoral systems to primary legislatures should also be decided by referendums, because otherwise politicians are writing the rules of the games by which they themselves get elected, and they have a vested interest therein. Um, beyond that, for you to decide, but I, you know, I, I don't think there is the same necessity beyond those two things, but I'm acknowledging in what I said right at the beginning, however, is the, the difficulty one can face, and it was there with both the Scottish Independence Referendum and the EU referendum, that um, we, it's not necessarily within the ability of the state to deliver. And of course, undoubtedly what is true, um, you know, the UK government was never going to agree to come to an agreement with the Scottish government in advance of holding the referendum in order for their people to know, insofar as it's possible to know, what independence might mean. Equally, the European Union wasn't going to enter into negotiations with the UK so we could find out how good a deal we'd get. And that almost, you know, their vested interest almost undoubtedly means that there is always going to be a constraint on the amount of information available, although it does potentially open up an argument and here I know I am at risk of getting into very hot water, that maybe in both cases we should have been starting off with what was going to be from the beginning a two-stage referendum process rather than a one-stage one. Now we have another question from Twitter. Erin Bargate has asked, if Theresa May asked you for advice, what would you tell her? Ah! <laughs> Well, I, um, I mean, I under, I mean, to be honest, you know, I understand where she's at, and to be honest, you know, given where she is at now, she frankly has no choice. Theresa May is above all trying to keep her party together. Difficult though that is, and I think she's perfectly well aware that if she pivots towards no deal or she pivots towards a soft Brexit, her party will split. And although you might think that after last night, the fact that actually she is minded to have another go, although for those who are not following us, John Boko is going, I'm not quite sure whether you'll be allowed to have another go, um, is, does mean that um, um, it, it, you know, she, may, she may not get the chance. But you know, she's trying to keep her party together. And uh, you know, given where she's at now, we can go back and we can go back to say, well, you know, should she have been, had the sense to try to negotiate a compromise, you know, that was a much more broad party compromise, perhaps.
But the honest truth is she would have still faced the fact that much, her, her party is deeply, deeply divided on this subject and whether or not she could keep it together if she'd kind of from the beginning gone and talked to Jeremy Corbyn and Keir Starmer, etc., and said, look, you know, can we come to an agreement? Got it through the House of Commons, yes. But would she survive the experience? I mean, in other words, in the problem she faces, you know, what one can see a pathway by which she might be able to get a Brexit deal that would get through the House of Commons, but she'd probably become the Ramsay MacDonald of her party along the way. And above all, Theresa May is a Conservative. I don't think there are that many people here that will remember the last Ramsay MacDonald government. But do we have some more questions? For those of you who want to know, and I, I assume I understand this correctly, that the amendment that means that the House of Commons is in, as opposed to no deal in all circumstances has been passed by four votes. Um, Caroline Spellman, who was meant to move the uh, motion, said she wasn't going to move it, but there was a discussion going on that one of the other movers would move it, and John Burko said you can't withdraw it, and it looks as though, mm -hmm. therefore, um, the government has lost again this evening. It, so the government, was, the government was coming out in favour of no deal, but the government's motion simply said no deal on the 29th of March and still left open the possibility that we might crash out on the 22nd of May or at some other point in the future. The House of Commons very, very narrowly, it seems, has voted to rule out no deal entirely. That will not make Theresa May's job any easier. I don't think it will, no. Irene, you had your hand up. Do you want to ask something? Do you, you want to wait in the microphone? Yes, thank, you. thank you, and uh, much echo the comments made earlier about such a very entertaining and informative um, presentation. And of course, it was all analysis, numbers, percentages, graphs, and that we, yeah, love, I know. we absolutely yeah, I know. love I that. Stuff. And um, I suppose you'd not be surprised that my question is around numbers. And my question is, when should you, you, you in fact, asked at the beginning, um, what is the outcome of a referendum? When can we say it's clear? Yeah. And therefore, should, if one group, the yes group of whatever the question is, is, say, 55%, leaving 45 as not wanting what the referendum's about, is that a clear decision? Or is it, in fact, a divisive decision? And you then, perhaps to your point about you need to have a second question, but actually have you got a clear decision? And should, my supplementary question is, if you haven't, what should be the rules for taking action from a referendum? OK, okay. I, I'll make two points. Uh, the first is that, in my view, if you hold a referendum um, and you discover that a majority no longer accept uh, the institutional arrangements that govern a country, it's very, very difficult to ignore that. And although um, there are lots of people at the moment are going, well, it was only 52%. I mean, can I just remind people of the rules of the referendum of March 1979, when Scotland voted narrowly in favour of holding, creating a then Scottish Assembly, um, it wasn't implemented because there was a 40% rule, and ever since, at least until very, very recently, most people have been saying such rules are a bad idea. Point one. Point two, I'll give you a political answer. I think the honest truth is, don't hold a referendum unless you know what the answer is going to be. <laughs> and referendums are de ideally mechanisms for demonstrating a consensus, or the nearest thing to a consensus, they are not necessarily a good way of solving an issue on which you are divided. So at the end of the day, uh, the Scottish independence referendum failed to um, answer the question because although David Cameron thought he knew what the answer was going to be, in fact, the answer was not as clear as he expected. And, you know, again, in 
2016, presumably Cameron presumed he could pull off the same trick that Howard Wilson did in 1975 and swing public opinion around while well, he didn't, and the moment he didn't, it was all in trouble. Um, so, um, and Nick Clegg, frankly, should have known what the answer was going to be to the AV referendum before he did it as well. So, um, referendums ideally are held, and so, you know, the, the, the classic case of a referendum which basically was demonstrating existing consensus was the Scottish devolution referendum of 1997. That said, let us remember that the Welsh Assembly referendum of the same date went through very, very narrowly but nobody, or virtually nobody, there, there is a scrap the Welsh Assembly Party, but it's, it's, it's small support. For the most part, devolution rights is now not only much more extensive than it was originally, but the principle of Welsh devolution is no longer argued about. So sometimes, narrow outcomes do succeed in generating a consensus. And, you know, I mean, who knows? You know, maybe eventually, somehow or another, we do manage to get out of the European Union and we discover, well, actually, you know, much like Norway, well, it's okay, it works, you know, we've kind of got a reasonable relationship and who cares? Who knows? But equally, we might still be debating about, about it in 20 years' time. Speaking about debating in 20 years' time, we have room for one succinct question to finish up that hopefully leads to a succinct answer. Mr. Yeah, Ray I got that, I got that pretty, yeah. Mr Ray in the corner there. Uh, thank you, Nick. Alan Ray. Um, you've indicated, uh, well, you started at the beginning by saying that the difference between a general election and a referendum, you've sort of indicated that Perhaps for questions about who governs us, you, you say a referendum is a better democratic tool. Mm -hmm. Is it, however, necessary to have a general election now in advance of any second referendum in order to have a functioning parliament to actually enact the result of a referendum? Uh, maybe two points about that. Um, well, at the moment, actually, uh, going for an early general election looks like quite a good idea from Theresa May's point of view because the Labour Party's fallen quite a long way behind. Um, and she might actually do better than she did in June 2017. That said, uh, everybody knows what happened in, in, in the 2017 election campaign. Um, and no, I won't bore you, but uh, a long, long running uh, subject I've been ar arguing is that don't stop assuming that British general elections are going to produce overall majorities. The electoral geography has changed in such a way that it's now much more difficult for anybody to get a substantial majority. It is no accident that we've had three general elections in a row in which we've either had a hung parliament or a very small majority. And that therefore one of the problems with holding a general election as a way of trying to resolve the so-called Brexit impasse is that it may not give us an answer. Um, this, however, the argument in favour would be this, is that would it to be, were it to be the case, and it has not yet done so, were it to be the case that the Labour Party were to come out in favour, in principle, of a second EU referendum, as opposed to what it's done so far, which is to create an extra hurdle that Theresa May has to get past. The Labour Party's current position on a second referendum is, well, if Theresa May, by some miracle, manages to get it through, deal through the House of Commons, will then also make her get it past the electorate. She has to pass both hurdles. And if, if, if there isn't her deal, that's it. We're not interested in the second EU referendum. So unless uh, the Labour, if the, the Labour Party were to come out in favour, and the Labour Party were to win an overall majority, or maybe the Labour Party in combination with the SNP and the Democrats would have an overall majority, you could then argue that there was a mandate for holding a second EU referendum, and that then therefore you'd create a legitimacy for holding that instrument. But you might just get a messy answer. Well, we don't like messy answers. <coughs> We don't like messy answers, but we might be stuck with them. Um, it's time to draw tonight's event to a close. Um, I'd just like to thank you all for your attendance. And I'd like to especially thank Professor Sir John Curtis for such a fascinating presentation and for answering your very good questions indeed. Um, thanks to those of you who joined us in the live stream. Thanks to those who asked questions. And I'm, my apologies to those who, who asked questions on on the live stream through the Twitter sphere, didn't get a chance to ask them. Those of you who couldn't ask here tonight, I hope you remember to ask questions at future meetings. I'll remind you about that. 
Um, the Institute and Faculty of Actuaries organises a number of events and conferences throughout the year, and this gives you the opportunity to discuss research and support the work as a learned society. Um, so please visit the website, actuaries.org.uk, for more information on that. Um, please also take some time to complete the feedback survey, which you will, be, will be sent to you by email tomorrow, as this will help us make improvements for future events. Um, I think we've learned one thing, which is don't hold a referendum unless you, want, you actually know what the answer is going to be. But with that thought, I'd be delighted if you would now join me for drinks and canopies outside. With that, I'll close the meeting and ask you to thank Sir John once again. <laughs>